Guys, this is the podcast that will set you apart in your fantasy league. The breakout players that are going to take a huge jump and win you your championship. Let's go! Jordan, open. Chicago with the lead. Brian, to shot. Not a game. Not a game. Not a game. We talking about practice. LeBron James with no record for human life. And he's going to go. G'day and welcome again to the Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Like we said off the top here, guys, we're going to be going through some breakout players, some players that are going to take a huge step forward or have at least the potential to take a huge step forward and win you your leagues. Um, my name is Mitch Casey and you can find me on Twitter or X at Ball Boys Fantasy. And uh, welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the channel over on YouTube there, guys. Uh, quick little announcement, obviously... Um, um, this video is uh, airing on Wednesday, my time, Tuesday over in the States. And um, if you haven't heard already, ballboysmba.com, the season guide is open and you can go and get our season guide. There are a few different options for memberships, depending on if you just are looking for uh, my top 150 rankings in both category and points leagues. But also, if you want to um, get some projections for both uh, category, points, head-to-head, roto, um, articles, exclusive questions and answers, dynasty rankings. You can also sign up for the Platinum membership over there as well. So there is uh, a lot of stuff on there already and there is more coming soon. So head on over to ballboysmba.com and uh, if you're looking for an edge in your fantasy draft, sign up to the season guide. Uh, put a lot of work into it, guys, and I hope that you guys do enjoy it. Um, so definitely head on over there and check that one out. But let's, uh, let's talk about today's podcast. We're going through... Um, Breakout candidates, we've got a bunch of players to go through in today's podcast. There are a lot of guys in this list. Um, Some I am more confident than others. And the way we're going to go through it is we're going to go from basically the start of the draft and where people are roughly being drafted. No super particular order here, but basically naming the players that have the potential to take a big step forward this season and also um, what their actual ceiling is. So if if it all comes together, like how high can they go? And then alongside that, my confidence in their ability to get to that ceiling and as and, and the reasons as to why I'm either more confident, less confident, um, the reasons why their ceiling might be super high or not so high and, and go through those type of scenarios. So make sure you stick around, guys, because there are a lot of breakout candidates in this podcast all the way to the back of the draft where you can get them late. So yeah. Make sure you stick around to the end and we will go through also at the end um, discussing how you can enter a league to verse me in fantasy basketball this season. So starting it off, let's dive on in. Breakout player number one, Anthony Edwards. Now, this player is getting a lot of hype already. Now, I don't know if the hype has maybe died down a little bit with the disappointment of the um, USA team, but... Just a couple of weeks ago, he was being drafted a lot of the times early in the second round, sometimes even on the turn of the first round in drafts. Now, I don't think that I would personally be drafting him there, but but he does have the potential to be a first-round player this season. Absolutely no doubt. Last season, again, I'll I'll put this little asterisk as well at the top of the, the video and podcast here because... When I have on this list here, and and people can see if they're watching over on YouTube, a ceiling I've got for Anthony Edwards, top 12 ceiling. Now, when I'm referencing a top 12 ceiling, it is a little bit vague. Um, Use that as, I guess, an idea of how we kind of visualize and view these players, that if next season I'm going to be drafting these guys, this is about where I'm going to be drafting them because of their value. Now, You can argue nine category rankings, eight category rankings, minus one uh, value. I'm going to lean more towards the general idea of the minus one value. Okay, so someone like a Giannis is not a 100 ranked player. He's a first round guy. So to me, that's where his minus one uh, value puts him at. So that's where I'm kind of valuing a player. But if you're ever confused about when I say top 12, it just means that when it's all said and done come next year, we're drafting Anthony Edwards as a top 12 player because he produced as a top 12 player last season or or this season. So 
hope that clears up what that means. But uh, And on the confidence side of things, I've got a number there. The range is going to be between one to five. So five out of five is I am super confident, um, you know, not locking or guaranteeing it by any stretch, but definitely I'm, I'm fairly confident they're going to get there. One being... I don't have any confidence at all. It could happen. It's possible, but I doubt it. Um, so Anthony Edwards being a confidence level of three here is that I'm kind of either way at the moment. I think that it wouldn't surprise me at all. It wouldn't shock me if he is a top 12 player. I'm definitely by no means predicting it. And I think if you are drafting him at sort of that 12, 13, 14 range, you are cutting out a lot of the upside there. So for me, in my um, projections, he definitely is someone I'm happy drafting in the second round. There are a lot of guys who are maybe more injury prone and risky at the back end of the second round as well. So I think that an Anthony Edwards is fine to go there just for the assumption that he's going to be there playing a lot of games. But how does he get there to be a first round player? So last season, he was the 41st ranked player in a nine category uh, setting. The biggest thing was he put up 24.5 points, 2.7 threes, nearly six rebounds, 4.5 assists, 1.6 steals, 0.7 blocks. Those counting numbers are all great. He put up 19.5 shots, went to the free throw line 5.3 times, um, decent. But the field goal percentage and the free throw percentage were both uh, negatives. Now, in all of his counting stats, he's a positive contributor. So it really is the efficiency for Anthony Edwards. I do believe that he can go from like a 46% field goal guy to maybe like a 48, 49% field goal guy. Um, Just again, he's super young. He's still only 22 years old. I believe he's entering his fourth year in the NBA. If he can get those shots up from 19 and a half, add an extra shot per game to 20 and a half, get to the free throw line once more. But the thing is with the free throws, if he does go to the line again, more attempts, his... um, negative free throw percentage at 75.5% does make it even harder to, I guess, make his way in there. So in my opinion, he's best suited to a punt free throw type build because of that free throw percentage. It is easier, as we saw in the statistical scarcity podcast, to make up field goal percentage later than free throw percentage. You can easily do that with the abundance of bigs in this um, season at Fantasy Basketball. Um, But... Those counting stats, you can easily see him putting up 26, 27 points a night, nearly three threes, the five rebounds, five assists, one and a half steals, close to a block for a guard is all amazing. It just needs to be more efficient. And if he does that, he's pretty much there already. So I think that will happen. He's 22 years old, but just be in, be aware that he hasn't shown it yet and you know, Carlton Towns was out for a bunch of last season. So there are a few reasons as to why he wouldn't get there. Hence, my confidence is at three, kind of right in the middle there. I wouldn't be drafting him there because, again, you're not getting much value at that point. Um, but he definitely has the potential, and it would not surprise me in the slightest. Similar kind of thoughts with this next guy here, Cade Cunningham. Now, I've got him here at a ceiling of about top 20, sorry, sorry, top 15 for Cade Cunningham, slightly behind that of an Anthony Edwards. I don't think he quite has the scoring upside of an Anthony Edwards, but he definitely has the rebounds, assists, the steals, maybe a touch behind, but the blocks similar, the threes similar, the points not quite as good, but the free throw percentage is really well. So he probably projects a little bit better in a nine category setting. Funnily enough, the turnovers are still really poor, but Last season, I don't think is a fair reflection of his value. He only played 12 games in that season. Um, You know, one of them was uh, early exit due to injury. And I just think that we really need to wipe the slate clean of Cade Cunningham's second year in the NBA. He was injured, stress, injury. Um, So he obviously was dealing with that for a little while during the season as well. So really, he's coming into his third year in the NBA, but really his second proper season to give it a go. And in his rookie year, he put up 17, five and a half, five and a half. In the limited time, we did see him put up 23 and a half points, six and six. So he did improve his stats. Um, the only thing that you could maybe consider a disappointment was the, oh, sorry, no, he put up 26 and six was the steals. But again, with such a small sample size going from 1.2 down to 0.8, it's, it's, it's so 
and again, steals are a very wildly fluctuating category that you, you basically just throw that out, um, in my opinion. He went he did that in 33 minutes per game. I think with Detroit having a lot of their young players, they're going to start to really push now. They're starting to really try and get some wins, get some games with this core um, under their belt. So I think he's going to start to play 34, 35 minutes. So you've got some minutes upside. Um, the threes are definitely going to improve. He shot 41% last season, again, in just the 12 games. So I could easily see that field goal percentage coming up. Now, I don't think he's going to be a positive contributor there, but I definitely think he's closer to 44, 45%. The free throw percentage, mid mid eighties, I think, is definitely what you can expect. And with that, the you know increase in usage. So he went to eighteen point seven points uh, shot attempts last season, which was up from his sixteen point one in his rookie year. So if he can get that again, just a little bit closer to twenty per game, uh, the free throw attempts up a little bit as he's getting a bit more acclimated to the NBA. He's not getting those rookie uh, calls anymore. Um, there's been some whispers about him and, and Jalen Duran doing really good things in the preseason, you know, at that USA Select camp. I just think that his game is so fantasy friendly. And when you put the projections in, it's hard for him to, especially in a minus one ranking sense, when you're punting the turnovers and the field goal percentage, he just fills up the box score everywhere else. Um, in my projections, he is literally a positive contributor in every single category outside of field goal and turnovers. So he's a perfect guy in that punt field goal turnover build. And he is being slept on, weirdly enough. This is about where I had him last season. I think I had a very similar video last year saying this. It didn't come to fruition because of the injury. And it was a bit of a slow start. So some people may be put off by that. I, I'm not. I'm not worried about it at all. I, I completely expect him to be a perennial top 20 player in the NBA in fantasy basketball. I think he's going to be fine, um, and I think Detroit are going to be getting the ball in his hands. And um, yeah, I think in terms of my confidence, I'm more confident in Cade Cunningham than I am in Anthony Edwards. I just think relying on Anthony Edwards to improve both his free throw and field goal percentage versus Cade just to bring those steals back up, continue his natural growth going into his third NBA season. Like the framework for Cade is is already there. It it's just him improving as a young player um, and, and just being more of that leader, more of that usage player. And I think in his third NBA season, his second proper go at it after missing most of last year, that's just naturally going to happen as a number one pick and a guy who has a high ceiling in the NBA. So for me, I'm very confident with Cade. Again, not taking him this high, but if you can get him in the 20s or 30s where sometimes he is going, I think that's a, a steal. I think he can definitely be someone that... Um, really takes a step forward this season. This is another guy I'm very keen on, very confident in. Evan Mobley is the next guy. Same draft class, probably in my opinion, the best rookie from that draft class. No no um, slouch Katie Cunningham, but I've been very impressed from Mobley so far this season. He, last year, I was keen on him as a, a breakout until that Donovan Mitchell trade that kind of tempered my expectations a bit, but even still, Last season, he improved his ranking. So he went from 74th in nine categories to 52nd. That was despite Donovan Mitchell coming over and his shot attempts remaining the exact same. So at, in his rookie season, he put up 12 shots per game. Second season, 12 shots per game. The difference really is, is he's gone from 50.8% field goals to 55%. His efficiency got a lot better. He also got a little bit more in terms of reboundings up from 9 to 8, from 8.3. A few extra assists, so up 0.3 assists there. The blocks actually went back a step from 1.7 to 1.5. And he's increased his scoring, so from 15 to 16. So the efficiency was the main thing here. Now, I think the Cavs had a disappointing playoff. They've gone in the offseason, and this is one of the more underrated signings, I think, of the offseason. They've acquired a player by the name of George Niang, who is an incredible floor spacer, great shooter, can play the four. And in a team like Cleveland, if you have a player like George Nyang, you've got players like Max Struess who can space the floor, play on the wings. You've got Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland there. Well, then to me, that limits the need for someone like a Jarrett Allen and you can move Evan Mobley more to the center. So I think you're going to see far more minutes of Evan Mobley at center this season. 
And we've seen that in the likes of like an Anthony Davis. The year before, Anthony Davis was averaging like nine rebounds per game. He moves to center. Last season goes right up to 12. His blocks go back up as well. So I think someone like that could happen to Evan Mobley. You could even potentially even see Jared Allen traded. I don't necessarily predict that, but it wouldn't shock me. Um, I just think that you're going to see more minutes of Mobley at center, even when they're both on the team. I think his minutes go up slightly, 34.4 minutes. Maybe that's up at 35, 36. He really is the future of this franchise. He is an all-NBA defender um, in, in only his second season. There's talk about him playing more as a playmaker. So there's assist, those assists can easily go up past um you know, three per game, rebounds closer to 10, blocks closer to two per game. I think the usage goes up. He's, you know, the same usage from your rookie season in year two. Even if that just goes up an extra couple of shots per game, you're looking at going from 16 points closer to 20 points per game. Um, And that's all before even mentioning the free throw percentage. If the free throw percentage can tick up, he's got a nice stroke. There's no reason to see, think he can't be like a, a 73, 74% free throw guy. Um, it did improve last season slightly. I think it can get close to that 70% again. There's just a lot of things that I really like about Evan Mobley um, and just the confidence I have him. I, I've got him at a three here because there's still a little part of me that worries that, you know, he is playing predominantly power forward and they don't move Jared Allen to the center position. But I, I'm i probably close to a four than maybe some of the other ones like an Anthony Edwards because I am with that signing of George and Yang, thinking that they are trying to get a bit more spacing out there for Cleveland. And um, yeah, just going to in year number three, I think he has a lot to prove in Evan Mobley. All right, here's a controversial one. Let's have a go. Jordan Poole as a breakout player. Now, really weirdly enough, I, I thought that this season, Jordan Poole moving to to Washington, everyone would be all over this man as a guy who was going to get every shot under the sun and people would be drafting him extremely high. It doesn't seem to be going that way. I uh, I think in my guard tears video, I got a bit of a pushback of having Paul as high, uh, sorry, having pool as high, high as I did. Um, but the man is going to get a lot of shots. He is also a player that has an extremely high free throw percentage uh, efficiency. He also gets to the free throw line at an extremely high rate, even in a backup role, starting role. It doesn't matter. Um, Last year, people were getting very excited about Jordan Poole around the 50 and 60 mark because obviously he had a good season the year before. The year before, he put up uh, numbers 18.5 points, three rebounds, four assists, 2.83s, and great free throw percentage. And that was done in 30 minutes. He came off the bench part of that year. He started that year with Clay coming back, Steph missing some time. He put up top 60 numbers. This is now him having the full range. He's going to be the 1A or 1B guy with Kyle Kuzma on this team. He's going to be playing, in my opinion, 34 to 35 minutes per night. So you're getting extra four to five minutes per game. You're also going to see extremely high usage. He's the number one guy. He's the go-to player. The efficiency is going to suck. Like, yes, there's that's definitely something that we're going to have to, to factor in. If you're not punting field goal percentage, be ready for that. But it, punt free throw. Punt, sorry, punt field goal. Who cares? And, and again, if you if you draft him and you get someone like a Zion or you get someone like, um, I don't know, a Sabonis or something like that in the, in the earlier rounds, like this guy, it, it's not going to be unrecoverable. And I think the value in his free throw percentage, which we've talked about being the hardest category to find, outside the first two rounds. The points, the threes, the assists are just going to be really, really valuable. They're all those, it's like that Trey Young type mold, not quite as good as Trey Young, but those three categories, points, assists, free throw percentage, they're all extremely hard to find later and he's elite in all of them. Maybe the assists aren't maybe what you would call elite, but averaging 4.5 in the Golden State Warriors team when you've got Draymond and Steph there, it's really him, Tyus Jones, that are the two primary playmakers. So I can see that going north of five per game. Three should be over three. Get like 24, 25 points at least. Could be higher. Um, and the free throws. Like he's going to get to the free throw line at least six times a game. I, I don't see how he doesn't get there at least six times a game. Shooting close to 90%, high 80%. It's just a huge boost in his value. And I really don't see... Too much argument in terms of his per-game production for him not being around that top 25 mark. Again, looking more towards that minus one ranking, yes, maybe his nine-category ranking might not be as good as that, but 
again, when you're punting in head-to-head leagues, you don't worry about the free throw uh, field goal percentage. The turnovers, I, I weight down a little bit less. So I'm really confident in him being a top 25 player. I've given him a full confidence. The only flag, the only asterisk I will say is that Washington, I believe, will suck this season. So there's a small chance that if any he gets any nicks and bruises or, or bumps along the way that he is potentially at risk of um, sitting some games down the stretch there if the Wizards go into a bit of a tank mode. But I think people are sleeping on him. I think people are too caught up in the fact that he was a disappointment last year because people were too high on him. I was pushing him down and saying, guys, chill. He's come off the bench behind Clay and Steph. But this season, different story. He's had stretches at top 30 value before. So I am, I'm very close to putting this as a five in terms of confidence because I think... I'm just, yeah, you can't you can't really talk me out of Jordan Poole being a great punt field goal percentage guy this season. Um, yeah, I just think he's going to be amazing. And don't, don't discount what that free throw percentage does to your team. Let's move on to the next guy here, Tyrese Maxey. Speaking of players who I was down on last season, but I'm in on this season. Tyrese Maxey, ceiling, top 40, confidence, four out of five. Um, James Harden situation is not getting any better. He is a guy that, does rely on efficient scoring, which is probably why he is not quite as high as someone like a Jordan Poole. He doesn't quite have the free throw percentage volume or efficiency that a Jordan Poole does. Not quite the assist player that he is either, but he's going to be better from the field. Um, he, again, he's playing second fiddle to Joel Embiid, so he doesn't have quite the green light that a Poole does, but similar type of players, but I definitely do favor a Jordan Poole over uh, a Tyrese Maxey. However, if you want scoring, if you want threes, if you want decent assists, I think they will be higher than maybe, say, five per game this season um, because of the... I'm, I'm not expecting James Harden to play much for Philadelphia this season. I think if he's on the roster and he is expected to play, he'll get out there and sulk and they might, you know... I, I, don't, I just don't really think that that scenario is going to go very well. Now, they might trade and bring some people back in. But again, you're not probably bringing someone back in like that's a a player who's going to be higher in the pecking order than a Tyrese Maxey. I think he's going to be the number two guy behind Joel Embiid. And I think that this is his time to shine. And especially the assists upside, which wasn't there when Harden was there. I think that takes him to another level. Being the 75th ranked player last season, he also, that ranking is affected by a little period where he came off the bench, had a few injuries and things like that. So I think top 50, top 40 is very realistic to expect. Anytime after pick 50, I'm very happy to go for a Tyrese Maxey, maybe slightly earlier if you're desperate for those points and threes. Um, But yeah, again, another one I'm pretty confident in. All right, we'll keep going down the list here. This might be a longer podcast, guys. I've got a lot of players I want to get through, so keep keep tuning in. But there's a lot of interesting names on this list. Devin Vassell is another guy. Again, I was high on Devin Vassell last season. And look, he was really good to start the year. He, um, he came out of the blocks firing. He improved his scoring a lot. The, the steals did kind of... They weren't disappointing, but... You know, he averaged 1.1 in 27 minutes, averaged 1.1 in 31 minutes last season. So there's a chance for that to tick up based on just his per minute steal rate in the year before in lower minutes. Uh, But the points definitely came up. The assists definitely came up. I expect that to happen again. I'm also expecting Keldon Johnson to move to the bench this season. So it would not shock me if Devin Vassell is the leading scorer on this San Antonio Spurs team that has Victor Wembanyama. They have Keldon Johnson, yes, uh, who was their leading scorer at last season. But I think Devin Vassell is going to have the green light. I think that the tanking may be less obvious and egregious this season. Um, so uh, if he scores 20 points per game and does it with three threes a game, not going to be shocked. If he averages close to four and a half, five assists per game, not going to be shocked. 1.3, 1.4 steals per game. Definitely doable. The free throw percentage also fell back last season. So he went from 84 down to 78%. You know, maybe it's somewhere in the middle there. So he's that, you know, positive contributor in free throw percentage. Uh, the field goals might be a little bit rough. Rebounding is not going to be amazing. But again, who cares when you're drafting a shooting guard player for rebounds? Uh, confidence is level is three. Just based on what does happen around the starting lineup. It's not confirmed that Keldon's coming off the bench. That's just what I think will happen. How much does Victor dominate the ball and, and is he going to be a superstar out of the gates and, and 
everyone else kind of just takes a back seat because he just is that good immediately. I'm expecting him to take a little bit to get going and Vassell to really establish himself early while Victor's kind of finding his feet. But Victor could come out and just dominate and, and that that might stop and, and limit the ceiling for Devin Vassell. He doesn't quite reach these heights. I think he is value in drafts. I don't think he's quite going this high. Um, so you can get him in those middle rounds with a little bit of upside there. Um uh, yeah, I, I, I just like me some Devin Vassell. I don't think last year, in terms of especially the rankings, is anything really to um, push him down your boards too much. This next guy here is the only guy who I have a confidence level of five, and it is Franz Wagner. The reason I'm confident in him being uh, this high is is his ceiling. I've got him at top 60. Now, to me, that's, that's definitely an improvement, but it's probably not the highest ceiling of all these players. On the list, he was 105th last season in nine category rankings. He just is one of those types of players that I think he just continues to get better, but there's no particular area that I think he just dominates and completely ascends and takes into a a whole new stratosphere of fantasy production. I think he just improves everything a little bit, goes from 32 and a half minutes to maybe 34, 35. The scoring is going to increase maybe a little more efficiently shoot some more threes, get some more assists. I just think it all just takes a small step forward. And so that's why I think you can pretty much just lock in top 60 value. Um, It is getting drafted close to around this point. So in terms of draft value, there's not as much as some of those other guys because I think it is, you know, it's year three. I think he's the best player on this team. The only maybe small thing you might say is that Paolo Boncaro, could just, again, take a huge leap forward to dominate this team, and it's just all going through him. I don't necessarily think that that's going to happen. I think Franz is still their best player. Um, but I don't know if you can really push him higher than this in terms of top 60. I don't think he suddenly becomes like a 1.5 steals guy or starts getting six assists or shooting, hitting three and a half threes per game. I just, I think it all just ticks up a little bit without anything really exploding and really shooting him up into the top 40 or 50 or 30. I don't really see that scenario happening, but a pretty safe top 60 player. And from being outside the top 109 category rankings, you could definitely consider that a bit of a breakout, but maybe not quite the most exciting of this list. Little bit of um, Aussie bias coming in for this next one here. Josh Giddy is the next player we'll talk about. I think his ceiling is around that top 50 mark. My confidence in him, though, is a little bit lower than some of the others. So I've got him at a confidence rating of two. He really impressed me last year. It is important to remember that this guy is not yet 21 years old. He is entering his third season. And in his year second season, he went from 42% in his rookie year up to 48%. So that's a huge improvement for a guard who isn't physically dominant. He just is incredibly smart. He's very, um, uh, what's the word? He's very sneaky with how he gets to the rim. He's very patient. Um, But going up to 48% from the field, which was a big negative for him in the previous year, is very encouraging in my opinion. The next thing for him that I think takes him to this top 50 mark is if he can get more to the free throw line and convert at a higher rate. So if he can get high 70s in his free throw percentage on, you know, four to five attempts, and that's a slight positive rather than a slight negative, and also improving his scoring as well. I think that's how he gets there. He was the 109th ranked player. But again, I don't think that that really encapsulates his value. He's an elite assist guy, a great rebounder for guards. Um... His scoring and efficiency in scoring is is valuable for teams that maybe are punting threes or punting field goal percentage. Sorry, punting free throw percentage. Um, the the slight concern is that obviously Chet is coming in, wasn't playing there. I think that could maybe put a bit of a hit to his rebounding numbers. So he put up seven point nine rebounds, seven point eight in his rookie season. They haven't really had that big dominant center on their team both those seasons. So I can see those rebounds taking a little bit of a hit. But I could also see the assists rising a little bit as well with um, Shea being a ball more of that attacking role, Giddy being that playmaker most definitely. Um, so all in all, I, look, I'm not super confident because there's a lot of ifs and buts about that one. And there's like Franz, there's no obvious way for him to get there. I don't love relying on people improving their free throw percentage to in both volume and uh, percentage to you know get that breakout. 
But if it does happen, I could easily see him being a top 50 player just because of the value of those rebounds, assists, um, the good, efficient shooting. Um, yeah, I just think that he's a, a really, really unique kind of player. Um, it would also be great to see those steals tick over to like 1.2, 1.3 per game. But again, not super confident that that happens. All right, let's talk about this next guy who is one of the more interesting players in the fantasy basketball landscape at the moment. And that is Alperen Sengun. Now, if I told you a ceiling for Alperen Sengun, I could get really wild here. I settled in on top 35 ceiling as a realistic ceiling for him. And my confidence for him to get there is a three out of five. So I'm sort of in the middle. Um, slightly on the optimistic side than the pessimistic side, but this is a guy that could easily go either way. What I fall upon for Shengun um, is the stretch that we saw him play when I think they had a few guys down or, or something was happening, that they put the ball in his hands and said, Shengun, you go do your thing. We're going to run the offense through you. And he went absolutely crazy. Um, if I find those... Um, stretches of games here. So he had a game where he went 32, 15, and 6 with 4 blocks. He followed that up with a 24, 12, and 6, 2 steals and a block. 19, 16, 7, a steal and 3 blocks. 21, 7, and 7. 21, 11, and 10, 3 steals, 2 blocks. A 14, 7, and 7, 2 steals, 2 blocks. There's a stretch there where he went absolutely crazy. He missed a game. I'm not sure. I can't remember if that was injury or not. Came back, and then the offense never quite went through him like it did during that time. Um, and I just think that the talent for this kind of a player always wins out. Now, a lot of people will compare him, and maybe unfairly so, well, definitely unfairly so, to a similar European big man in um, Nikola Jokic. But if we remember, cast your minds way back to Nikola Jokic. Um, I'm just pulling up his uh, season log here. But... There was a frustrating time for Nikola Jokic where he was playing low minutes as a rookie. He played 22 minutes per game. The next season, he did put up uh, the 18th best ranked player in 27.9 minutes per game. But it never really was until his third NBA season where he started playing 32 and a half minutes and really dominating and the offense really going through him. Mike Malone was very stubborn. And and I'm not not saying that Shengun is Jokic, but sometimes these coaches, especially, you know, bad ones, um, take a little bit of time to come around. And, and I don't think that Imi Yudoka is a bad coach. I think he's actually a very good coach. He has a reputation of being a good defensive-minded guy, but what has he gone out and done, or what have they gone out and done this preseason, this offseason? They've gone and got Fred Van Vliet, who's a great perimeter defender uh, from the guard spot. They've got Dylan Brooks, the FIBA World Cup defensive player of the tournament. So their perimeter defense is much improved. So I think that that definitely helps a player like Shengun. You don't really have any other options behind him. I'm not... I don't think I'm too worried about the small ball lineup because I don't think Jabari or uh, Tari Eason, as much as we love them, from a real NBA point of view, that they're just not as... I mean, they don't have the potential to be as good as Shangun. Like, yes, they might be better, but the ceiling of Shangun is higher than both of those players, in my opinion. So, and he's... He's super young. He's still only 21, I want to say. And again, he's coming into his third NBA season. Sometimes it feels like we've been waiting for the breakout forever. But yeah, twenty. he's only just turned 21 years old. Um, took huge improvements last year. Um, you know, went to the 80th ranked player and he did that in 29 minutes. I think he can get to 32, 33 minutes a night this season. I think that... The offense might run a little bit more through him. He's looked really good in the FIBA competitions. And again, at 21 years old, that natural progression, the upside, which we have seen when the team runs through him, um, is really, really palpable. So I'm a bit more on the optimistic side. The pessimistic side of me, obviously, the reason that we're not drafting him at this point is because we haven't seen it yet. The percentages are, are, are a bit of an issue. The fact that he can't shoot that well is a bit of an issue. Um, and there's a new coach, okay? So we don't know what the new coach is going to think of him. It will be an extremely uh, important player to, he'll be extremely important for us to watch in the preseason and, and, and the comments coming through about how they're going to use him, how much he's going to play and all those things. The, the talk about any small ball lineups are also very important for us to, to take into account. But I think 
right now, I'm on the optimistic side of Shen Goon, um, but there is definitely a room for, to be disappointed. But he, by, by no doubt, in my mind, he has top 35 upside. Um, probably higher if, if I was really going, um, uh, you know, crazy on it. But I think top 35 is, is realistic for us to expect. Next guy here, we've got a bit of a run of centers here, is Jalen Duran, a player that I'm very keen on. Um, I think he's got top 50 ceiling this season. I did a tweet out the other day, just a reminder to everyone that Jalen Duran is still technically a teenager. <laughs> he's not yet turned 20 years old. He was one of the youngest players in the draft. Um, and look, he, you'd be forgiven for not realizing he was a teenager because he looks like a man mountain. But in his starts last year as a starter in 29 minutes, he averaged 10 points, 10 and a half points, 10 and a half rebounds and 0.9 blocks, 1.4 assists and did that on 67% shooting. That was with without Cade Cunningham, which again, we go back to those reports of the USA Select team. They were great together, good chemistry. They've been working obviously in the off season. Um, again, He's 19 years old. Like, what kind of center is a finished product at 19 years old? So I think that 10 and 10, one block per game is an absolute minimum for um, Jalen Duran. I was big on him in the in the pre-draft process. He's got some upside as a, uh, a playmaker. He's got some upside as a creative scorer, not just that, you know, rim running big man. Look, without getting too crazy, like, could he average 15, 11 with a block and a half on 65% shooting with two assists per game. Yeah, like he could do that. Like top 50 numbers are absolutely within his wheelhouse. The slight hesitation is, okay, he is young. So maybe we are getting a little bit of ahead of ourselves. He's still quite young. He's still developing. Um, he hasn't played with Cade Cunningham before. There's also these centers that the Pistons seem intent on trying to get minutes. Do they play minutes at center? Are they exclusively power forwards? What are they doing with Isaiah Stewart? Is the spacing there a little bit clunky as Detroit starts to figure it out? So there might be some teething problems early in the season, um, but I expect by the time that fantasy playoffs come along, they'd have, one, realized that those players, Marvin Bagley and James Wiseman, are no good. So you're not going to limit Jalen Duran. And I believe he's the center of the future. They've got their core. They've got Cade. They've got Ivy. They've got Asar Thompson. They've got Duran. To me, those are your four core pieces, you're building around those four players. The fifth person, you just need a shooter and a floor spacer in there. Um, and off you go. Like, let's let's do this thing, Detroit. I think that he is a guy with huge ceiling just because of his age, um, how physically dominant he can be. The untapped upside, which we haven't quite seen as much in the NBA, but again, with a new coach, someone who probably, you know, lets the rookies play a little bit more than a Dwayne Casey, I think that he could definitely be a big breakout candidate um, moving forward. And another guy who often gets compared to him is another breakout potential candidate, and that is Mark Williams. I've got his ceiling a little bit lower because just in terms of his ability as a player, I don't quite rate him as high. I don't think that there's that offense and playmaking upside for him. But what he has shown so far is a slightly better ability to block shots um, than a Jalen Duran. Now, Duran did block a lot of shots in college, but didn't translate last season. But Mark Williams did a little bit better, not quite to the heights of a Walker Kessler, mind you, but did have the ability to block shots. I just, again, I don't know if I see him being a starter that plays 32, 33 minutes a night. I think he's more of a 28 minute a night starter rather than a 32, 33. I also, there's a few question marks about the rotation in Charlotte. Um, I don't think the usage is going to be very high in particular. Um, Now, in his starts last season, he put up 11.6, 9.8 rebounds, 1.1 blocks, and that was in 27 minutes per night. Cool. So I think that that can tick up a little bit. I just don't know, like a Duran, how much more of there is for him to really take another step. He's much older, so he's nearly 22 years old. So basically two years older than a Jalen Duran. So again, I'm just expecting a little bit less of a jump forward in his actual ability uh, on the court. But he definitely, I think, is going to be a starter this season. Between 28 and 30 minutes a night is reasonable to expect. So if you can get, um, you know, 13, 10, and 1.3 blocks out of him, absolutely no fun, no problem with that. And when you're drafted outside the top 120, that's a huge steal. I think that will change when we get close to the season. Uh, but in terms of, Pushing higher than top 60, 
I don't know if I can reasonably say that that's a realistic season to uh, ceiling to expect from a Mark Williams, but I think uh, I'm fairly confident that he could be around that 60 to 70 mark as a solid big man that will provide you those classic stats. Um, but yeah, w- won't really get you the assist steals, no threes or anything, nothing else out of the box from him. Um, but yeah, just a classic big man that I think will have the opportunity this season. Stick with me, guys. We've got lots of players to get through. Scotty Barnes is next on the list here. Now, a lot of people might be pretty keen on him. I know there's very um, protective Scotty Barnes fan club out there. The Raptors fans, very passionate and love you for it. But I'm not too sure about what's going to happen with the Raptors this season in terms of, obviously, they're missing Fred Van Vliet. So the expectation is that Scotty Barnes is going to step up and be the point guard. But you've also signed um, Dennis Schroeder who coming off the FIBA World Cup MVP performance. I mean, that's all well and good, but I wouldn't get too carried away. Look, I think they're going to try him at point guard, whether it's a full-time gig or just him running the point a little bit at stretches here and there. I just don't know where he really takes a step up. For him to really get his ceiling, which I've listed at top 50 here, he needs to either become a really efficient scorer um, and be that kind of a guy that shoots 51, 52% from the field, and that accompanies a uh, a small increase in his usage. So if he does that and goes out, out and averages, you know, 20 points, seven rebounds, five assists, and he does that on, you know, 52% from the field, then yeah, that's a top 50 player, and he averages a steal per game. That's a top 50 player. You punt the free throws, you punt the threes or both. Great, that's an awesome player to have on your team. I just don't know, based on what I've seen, how much I expect that to happen. In his rookie season, he was better than his uh, um, sophomore season or his second year in the NBA. He regressed in the field goal percentage. Um, I just don't know exactly where the next step for him is. I don't know if I see him really coming along as an offensive player. I do expect the assist to rise just through sheer attempts and um, responsibility. But it's not really enough for me to believe in him as a guy that's going to really rock up the rankings because he does still have some deficiency in his game. The field goal percentage isn't quite a huge positive. It may be slightly positive, but it's not a massive positive. The free throw percentage is poor. Steals and blocks are okay without being outstanding. The rebounds, as a guy who's power forward eligible, it's actually not that great. Uh, again, he was 7.5 rebounds the year before, but Yucca Pirtle is now on this team. So I think that steals a lot of the, um, uh, the the rebounding and blocks edge from a player like um, Scotty Barnes. So after the, the trade deadline, he went down to 0.6 blocks and 5.4 rebounds. So down from 6.6, I think he's going to be close to that five rebound mark, more than the six rebound marks with that Yucca Pirtle inclusion, which probably hurts him more than a Fred Van Vliet Tra- uh, uh, the loss of Fran Vavli helps him. So I think compared to before Jakob Pertl being there and after Fred Van Viet was there, it's it's almost like a net negative in my opinion, despite some people thinking that it's a net positive because he's going to become the point guard in this team. And I just don't know if he really has the ability to be a full-time point guard and, and make that as an efficient role for him. So, But... I could be wrong, and he could definitely come out and surprise me, and that's why he definitely is a breakout candidate. I just have him at a confidence of two because I don't necessarily think that's going to really play out. But again, could be wrong. Daniel Gafford is one of those other centers uh, like uh, Duran and Williams that you can get relatively late in drafts that has really good upside. Top 50, in my opinion. He's the best shot blocker, at least so far in the NBA, of those three guys. Um, But probably the worst rebounder of the three as well. I also think that of all the three, he's the guy that I'm the least confident in, um, at least in the way that the team views him moving forward. I don't think that... Washington necessarily view him as like the center of the future. They're starting a rebuild. They're starting this period of, um, call it tanking, or, you know, they're going to be trying to get bad quickly, get draft picks. And look, they don't have many players to back him up at the moment. But I think in teams like this, those kind of things can change. Injuries obviously um, can pile up. And, and when you're tanking and things like that, that can definitely hold you out of games. But Look, theoretically, if he plays 30 minutes a night, he's pretty comfortably a top 50 player. Um, My issue is come fantasy playoffs, come post-trade deadline, 
Do they bring in someone else that they just want to try? Like, does James Wiseman find himself on the Wizards? And and I don't know, they're, they're the next team to fall for trying to give James Wiseman a go. I don't know. Like, crazy things happen on these kind of teams and, and they always love to experiment because, like, they've got nothing to lose, right? Like, be bad. Try things. Be bad and, you know, convince yourselves that James Wiseman's going to be something. And I don't know. It, th- those kind of things just worry me a little bit. I also haven't seen him put up the minutes that we're expecting him to put up yet. So last season, 20.6 minutes. Does he have the ability to stay out of foul trouble enough to be a 30-minute-per-night guy? Um, and and again, when you're, when you're scaling up a player who's been a low-minutes-per-minute beast, a lot of the times when you increase the minutes, the block rate does fall down a little bit. Maybe the uh, field goal percentage does fall a bit down a little bit. Again, he's not the best rebounder, especially for his position. Um, I don't think he's going to be a guy that averages 10 boards per game, probably closer to eight or nine. Again, very empty elsewhere in the assist steals and threes. The free throw percentage is okay. He's not, not too bad, doesn't get to the line very much. Field goal percentage is great. But it's just, it's just something we haven't seen him do in the past. And even as a starter last season, he started 47 games, played less than 25 minutes as the starter, and he put up 11, 6, and 1.4 blocks. So whilst we can all get very excited and the potential is high, I'm just a little bit cautious of going too early on a player like Gafford. I think for my instance, I would prefer to get a player like Duran and Mark Williams where I feel more confidence in their place in the team and I think that they're more locked into a higher minute role than a play, player like Daniel Gafford, who could easily outproduce those guys. But I think the floor for him is a fair bit lower than those other boys. All right, last little, well, not quite the last big man, but the last true center on this list here is Onyeka Akongu. I think, again, much like those kind of guys, he has top 50 upside. For him, it's all about the trade. It's all about, does Clint Capella get traded? I think he does this season. I think that... Coming into his fourth year, he's about to sign his rookie extension, if I'm not mistaken, in terms of uh, Onyeka Okongwu. It just makes sense that if you're going to pay this man, which I expect him to do, a lot of money, you're going to want to see him start. And that will motivate the team, in my opinion, to trade Clint Capella and make the most out of their assets because you can't get these centers out on the court and play together. They're just not the types of centers that play together. And in a team that's trying to compete, you want to get the best players on the court. And if you can turn a Clint Capella into someone better that maybe fills that uh, gap at power forward or small forward, I think that's a better and more sensible thing to do. So I do think that Clint Capella eventually is traded and that Onyeka Okongu does start at some point. It's just about how patient can you be until that point. So my confidence is three. I would say it's a five um, if he was starting. If he was starting top five, lock, uh, top 50, lock it in. Like, it's happening. He's definitely a guy that's going to do that quite easily. He can uh, score efficiently, rebound. He can, you know, get really good assists for a big man. The steals are solid. The blocks are amazing. The field goal percentage is great. The free throw percentage is not ideal, but it's not terrible. So he's a really friendly fantasy guy. So I think top 50, you'd lock that in. It's just about when, and there's still a little bit of an if. There's still a little bit of an if if Clint Capella is traded. I think it happens. But it might not. We've, we've seen these kind of things happen. We think a trade's happening and it does end up eventuating. So you're kind of holding this player, waiting for it to happen, Isaiah Jackson. Um, and it just doesn't happen. So I'm confident it does, but you can't guarantee it. So I've got him at a three confidence. This next guy here, um, I'm really excited about this player, Paul Reed, breakout players. Now, if you haven't heard of Paul Reed, I mean, you'd be forgiven. He's not the biggest household name, but Paul Reed, B-ball Paul, is a per-minute beast. This is this year's version of Isaiah Jackson, in my opinion, but I'm more excited about Paul Reed than I was for Isaiah Jackson last year. Based on what I'm hearing out of um, Nick Nurse in comments, he was on the Patrick Beverly podcast talking about are they going to play Paul Reed and... Joel and B together. And he said, absolutely, like lock it in. He's going to have a much bigger role this season. And I, I started salivating <laughs> because this man is a permanent beast. He um, only played, what did he play? 11 minutes a game last season. If he gets 20 plus, 21, 22 minutes per game, this guy has the potential to be a top 100, top 90, top 80 player in those limited times. If for whatever reason he becomes a 28 to 30 minute a night starter, top 40, top 50 is not outrageous. It is absolutely possible. The steals, the blocks, the rebounds, 
Um, the efficient scoring, the assists are not horrible either. This man is just a fantasy beast. He, he the defensive stats is is his game. That's where he gets a lot of his value. So think of a player like. Um, like a Jonathan Isaac back when he was his top 25 kind of a guy, like that type of uh, fantasy permanent production. Um, and if he is a guy that does play next to Embiid, he's only got PJ Tucker ahead of him at power forward. Like PJ Tucker, he's 30, what, 38, 39 years old, doesn't do anything special. They've got a new coach. And if you get in Nick Nurse's good books and you pay, like what if he comes out and plays 33 minutes a night? Like this guy could, Absolutely tear fantasy leagues apart. Now, you don't draft him there. You absolutely did not draft him there. That's, this is the Isaiah Jackson of last year, and we saw what happened with Isaiah Jackson. It never eventuated. But it's a big, big watch for me in the preseason. How much of this is actually true? They've talked about using him as a Pascal Siakam type of role. Like, is he, uh, you know, is he a playmaking guy that they want to get the ball in the hands? Is assist benefit because of that? Lots of lots of intriguing comments. We've seen the permanent production. We just want to see it happen in the preseason. Um, he's a guy you're not touching until outside the top 100, probably top 110. I'd prefer to get him after I've drafted all my starters and I'm filling in my bench with high upside guys. But as soon as that happens, I'm grabbing him. I might even, if things go positively in the preseason, grab him as my last starter and get a more boring guy in where I would normally get my upside picks in that spot because the upside on this player is really special. Um, this is very bullish because the what range of outcomes is huge for this player. So that's why I've got his ceiling so high and my confidence low. But the top 40, top 50 upside in a 28, 30 minute night starter is real. I think more realistically in a 23, 24 minute a night role, top 75, top 80 is what we can expect. But again, the downside of he's playing 16 to 18 minutes a night and he's not really rosterable is still a risk there. But one of the best flyers you can take late in the drafts is Paul Reed. Let's fly through these last few ones because we're starting to get into sort of the backer end of the draft. Jabari Smith Jr., my guy from last season. Look, I was wrong last year on Jabari. I can wear that. He Look, he started playing a lot better down the stretch of the season, but for me... I was I was too high on him. I was too keen. The steals didn't come, which is the thing that I expected to. That didn't happen. But, you know, the three-point scoring, the low efficiency was all what we could expect. The rebounds were solid. He's going to have a decent coach this season that might actually run some plays for him, maybe. Who knows? Um, and that might be something that he can benefit on. I think his efficiency takes a step forward. He's still super young, 20 years old, so he's uh, only just turned 20. Um so you can see those threes tick up, the scoring tick up, the field goal percentage tick up. The biggest thing here is how much does he play at center? Are the steals just completely gone and we should never expect them? I wouldn't expect them, but is there a world where he averages 16, 8, a steal, a block, two threes? Like, that's a top 75 guy. My confidence is at a two because there's so much talent on this Houston Rockets team, um, which is why I think you can draft him sort of outside the top 100 mark. But he still is that guy that, he still has that potential in him that I thought he could have been last year, but I just don't want to get burnt twice again. But again, there is a reason I was really high on him last year. Um, so he still has the potential to get there. Let's talk about this next guy who I was down on, and I, I think rightfully so, but we do have to admit that Paolo Boncaro has a ceiling on him. His fantasy game is not the most friendly, especially when it comes to a nine-cat ranking. But again, if I'm thinking about you know, punting the free throw percentage, which you absolutely probably need to do for, for um, Paolo when he gets to the line eight times a game and shoots less than 75%. That is a big negative. But he also doesn't shoot threes. He doesn't get steals or one, you know, less than steal per game. You know, for a bigger guy, half a block per game is not going to get it done. The assists are okay. The rebounds are okay. I think he's going to take a big step forward in terms of his field goal. So last year, he shot 42.7%. I think that that will nearly be a positive for him this season. I expect more closer to 48, 47, 48% uh, from the field, playing a little bit closer to the rim. Maybe he plays a bit more at you know backup center this season. We saw him play center in the FIBA World Cup. I think that's positive for him. But just being that bigger body, you can expect a big jump in year two. Field goal percentage is usually one of those categories that from year one to year two, we see a big jump. And for a player like Paolo, I definitely expect that. It's just how much can you do with the other stuff? 
Can he hit more threes? Can he get some steals and blocks? If he can get anything like that, get anything close to one and one steal per block, one steal, one block per game, then yes, top 70 is absolutely uh, in the wheelhouse. He probably has an outside shot at a much higher than this, but that would require field goal percentage, free throws, three steals, blocks to all improve. And I just don't think that's realistic to expect. I think he'll score a bit more, rebound a tiny bit more, but it's really the field goal percentage that I think takes a big step up this season, which changes him from, you know, in a nine category sense, 210 to maybe close to a top 100 guy. And then if you're punting the free throw percentage, he's much more valuable. So in a punt, uh, or oh, minus one rankings, that top 70 range feels like a decent upside for him to achieve. All right, these last three guys are definitely more of your flyer type. So Tari Eason, he has a top 70 ceiling based pretty much solely on the steals and defensive numbers. We know this. I've given him a one in terms of my con- uh, confidence because I just don't see the path for him to get minutes. I think they play Brooks, uh, Jabari, and Shengun, the bulk of the minutes in the front court. He's still got a Men Thompson who can play a little bit on the wing as well. Um, Tyra will get his minutes, but I just don't think it's going to be enough. But if he did, if there was an injury of some kind, or if he beats out Jabari in the preseason for that starting power forward role, yes, he can be a top 70 player. But until then, I think he's just a late round flyer and a steals specialist. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much all I have to say about Tari. But he definitely has potential as a breakout player, as does this player, Jalen Johnson. Similar type of thing. Maybe not quite the per game upside as a Tari Eason, but a little bit more of a path to minutes. There's not quite as much in front of him. There's only really Sadiq Bey. Um, who's the other guy that's in there as well? DeAndre Hunter at small forward. You know, those kind of guys standing in front of him. I think that he could easily overtake them in the preseason. And if that does happen, um, you could definitely bump him up his boards. At this stage, I'm not expecting it. I don't think he will get past them at least early in the season. So that's why my confidence is a one. Top 85 upside uh, as a ceiling, I think is reasonable to expect. Solid points, rebounds, steals, blocks, and decent enough assists with good uh, field goal percentage is all reasonable to expect. But... Again, a lot would have to kind of come together and I don't expect him to start. But on the off chance that he does, he could definitely be a breakout. And then the last guy on the list today, Shaden Sharp. Um, top 85 upside, confidence of two. So higher than the other two there, guys. The confidence will change if there's a Damian Lillard trade between now and the time this podcast comes out. So if Lillard gets traded, it'll probably jump right up to a four. But the other thing about Shaden Sharp, I've given him a ceiling of top 85 he doesn't really have the best fantasy game at the moment because of the lack of steals, blocks, and I don't know what we can expect from an assist point of view. He did have a stretch down at the end of the season where he put up 18 and a half, five rebounds and three assists as a starter. I think that that could be reasonable to expect, but even in that time, he was outside the top 200 with some funky percentages, low defensive stats. So... Kind of in that, uh, I guess, Jalen Green kind of mold where he scores, he hits threes, he gets a little bit of assists, but the rest of it is all below par with bad percentages. He's still really young. Um, He's only just turned 20 years old. So um, I think there's, there's definitely a ceiling here in terms of he could definitely easily be a top 100 guy, but we do need to remember that he's... He's not. He hasn't shown to this point the most fantasy friendly game. Um, so whilst he is still, he still has that aura of a mystery box around him. Um, from what we've seen so far, his fantasy game has not been the best. He's been in different roles. So again, very dependent on if Damian Lillard is there or not. So if Lillard is traded and he features as that like that number two guy next to Scoot, this definitely becomes much more realistic. But at the moment, I'm expecting that to not happen at the start of the season, and for that trade to happen partway through the year. Um, So for right now, I've got him at a confidence of two and a ceiling of top 85. Well, that will do it for us today, guys. Um, Let me know what your thoughts are down in the comment section below on YouTube. Um, Who did you think I missed? I know I didn't go through everyone, but we went through a lot of players there and some good picks, I think, in terms of targets for your fantasy drafts this season. Reminder, if you want to verse me in fantasy basketball this year, you can go over to the Apple Podcast section of this podcast. Give it a five-star rating and review and drop your Twitter handle in the review there. 
I am going to be announcing in a, f- a couple of weeks, two or three weeks, who is going to be in there and sending out invites. There are still lots of spots available, guys. So don't feel like you've missed it. Go ahead, drop that review, drop your Twitter handle and get into that league. I will be sending out invites very soon. So do so for your chance to enter. It will be a $25 entry. The uh, There is over $700 worth of prizes. So lots to be won. And also come up and, and verse me and try your luck. See how you go. Uh, but until then, guys, I'll catch us later. Bye.